travel with you guys and invite you into a time travel machine, fictitious of course, uh, but we're going to travel back to the first century uh, in a region called Galilee that was north of Jerusalem where uh, there was a big lake there that they called the Sea of Galilee. The Sea of Galilee had some Roman towns that were around it with um, heavily Roman populated towns and cities, uh, but there was also a significant Jewish population. Uh, Jewish people were scattered all over the place, um, and they had synagogues that were lined up around the, around the Sea of Galilee. And uh, most of these towns were pretty quiet, but you had everything from extreme poverty to extreme wealth. Um, there was some in between, but uh, you had this really pretty radical divide between extremely wealthy people um, and then extremely poor people. In your poor towns, uh, you had common people who did common work. Uh, for common wages. They were not wealthy. Uh, they made an average wage. Uh, some of those trades were things like fishermen, um, as you'll see in, in the lesson today. Uh, the disciples who Jesus called, but you also had your highly educated people. You had high education and low education. Uh, you had your rabbis uh, who were highly educated Jewish people. They were responsible for knowing the Bible and knowing it well, um, and they would teach people, and that was kind of their profession. Uh, there's kind of a joke among uh, Jewish people, and Bill Riggs often talked about this. Uh, they, were in the, uh, they were in the business of fighting with each other. They would argue and debate, and Bill said, when you go visit, um, he said, when you visit Israel, you'll still find rabbis that stand on the street corners, and they just shout at each other. And he said, if you didn't know any better, you'd think they were enemies, because they're just shouting back and forth. And he said, actually, what they're doing is these are trained rabbis who are, who are debating with each other. So it's iron sharpening iron, and they just argue back and forth. Um, and that is what they do professionally. So if you think about Jesus um, picking his disciples, let's suppose that you lived 2,000 years ago. Um, you're a common person. Some of you may be really educated people, uh, educated in the scriptures. And now all of a sudden there's somebody who is a really well-respected, trained rabbi, um, and he's coming and he's recruiting people. Uh, who do you think he's going to select? Well, it's kind of interesting, right? The people he selected were very ordinarily common people. They were fishermen. They were not trained well uh, in the scriptures. They knew the scriptures, but they were not trained well. They were not highly educated. In fact, uh, whenever I went through both college and graduate school, uh, in our Cohen A Greek classes, our first Greek class that we took when we started translating the Bible, we translated the Gospel of John. Um, and the class was called Elementary Greek. Well, it's not a play on words. Uh, we were literally learning Elementary Greek because John was not well educated. Uh, his style of Greek was completely different from Paul. Paul's is really complex. Uh, Paul uses big words. Paul uses these complicated sentence structures. But John, on the other hand, wrote on about a, probably a third or fourth grade level. Um, and he was one of the 12 apostles. So I thought that was kind of, this was kind of interesting. Um, Jesus calls them, and this is the, the, the um, passage that Terry read for us this morning. In Matthew chapter 10, verses 1 through 4, I kind of separated this out, but he called to him his 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits, that is demons, to cast them out and to heal every disease and every affliction. Would you say that's a pretty high responsibility? Nod your heads like this, yeah, right? That's a huge responsibility. Can you imagine common fishermen who go out, all they do is they fish for a living, um, they're mending their old nets, uh, they don't have great equipment, they don't have all the latest equipment, they're just common fishermen, and all of a sudden Jesus calls them, and now they have authority to cast out demons and to heal every single disease known to man and every affliction. That's incredible. So who were these people? The names of the 12 apostles were these. First, Simon, who's called Peter, and Andrew, his brother. James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother. Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, and James, the son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. Now, these guys were a hot mess of people. 
Um, I've talked about this before. They had clashing personalities. You had everything from a zealot, and zealots were really overbearing. Zealots got their name from the zeal that they had. They were zealous people. There was a sect of the Jews where they, they were fully convinced that everybody else was wrong and they were right. I mean, there was no, uh, there was no convincing them otherwise. So you have some really loud, boisterous people. You have others who are just kind of common fishermen who just, you know, their lot in life is to catch fish and sell, sell some just to kind of get along. Um, and you have others who are tax collectors like Matthew, who's really educated. Uh, he knows math really well, not real well liked among the people because the Roman taxes were insane. Uh, if you think we have high tax rates now, uh, go back to the first century and you would learn the word oppression through taxes. Um, taxes were incredibly high, incredibly oppressive, especially for poor people. So I think this is kind of interesting because Jesus intentionally chose people who were workers. Let me say that again. Jesus intentionally chose people, disciples, followers who were workers. Period. They had a good work ethic and they had faith. Jesus didn't go after the rabbis. He didn't go after the people who were really well-trained in the law. He didn't go after people who knew the scriptures front and back, left and right, who had all of them memorized. Jesus chose very common people to be his followers, his closest followers. I'm going to back up just a little bit uh, to the paragraph before what Terry read in uh, Matthew chapter 10, verses 1 through 4. This is what's recorded. And Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into the harvest. Who's he talking to? He's talking to laborers. He's talking to his disciples who owned businesses. They, they knew that if they didn't work, they didn't get fed. And they didn't feed other people's families either for the people who they hired. He was talking to, the, to his disciples, and, and, and so he tells them, there's this big harvest out there, and we need more disciples. We need more workers. We need people like you. It's interesting. He didn't say we need more educated people. We need people trained in seminaries. We need people trained. He didn't say that. He said we need laborers. And then what Terry read for us, he called the 12 disciples. He gave them all this authority over demons to cast them out, to heal every disease and every affliction. The same thing that Matthew records that Jesus was doing just a few verses back. And then over the next couple weeks, we're going to go through Matthew chapter 10 because there's a progression here. And Matthew talks about him sending them out. He takes those disciples. He says, we need more laborers. And then he sends them out in pairs. Two by two, he sends them out into all these different towns and cities and villages. So I came across this article on Indeed.com. And I thought it was interesting uh, because if we think about making disciples, if we think about equipping people, equipping each other for the works of ministry, how do we do that? How do we make disciples? How do we train people for works of ministry? How do we train each other? Aren't we already doing it? Sort of. So why do we need a whole year on this theme? Well, it's interesting because it's something that we don't do well in the church. We don't make disciples well. Brent talked about that a little bit in the class this morning. We don't do it well, and I think the answer is really quite simple, because if we, th if we think about the workforce, what are the qualities for employers who are looking for employees, right? Because that's what we are. We are workers for the kingdom. Plain and simple, each and every one of us, young and old, all the way down to the youngest here, to the oldest, we are workers for the kingdom of God. So I came, came across this article from Indeed.com, uh, and it listed nine qualities of a good employee. And I think this will resonate with a lot of you. Number one, dedication. They are dedicated to their job. It's not hit or miss. It's not show up to work when you want to, though um, some of you employers 
know that people will try this, right? Um, the no call, no show, that didn't work. Nine qualities of good employee means that number one, they're dedicated, incredibly dedicated. Um, number two, they have confidence. They're not constantly asking you, what do I do? Is this okay? They're not asking permission to do their job, right? The disciples didn't come to Jesus every single time they healed somebody or every time they talked to somebody and say, Jesus, can we get your permission to do this? They had confidence that Jesus gave them this authority to cast out demons, to heal people, and to teach people, and they went out and they did it. Confidence. Reliability. They were present. Right? Do you ever see places, well, sometimes we see places where the disciples abandoned, um, but that was when Jesus was at the cross, right? But throughout the ministry, they were there. Even through all of their mess-ups, they were present. Jesus didn't call perfect people because the disciples, were, they were a hot mess. They made so many mistakes. They argued with each other about, you know, who was going to heaven, who was going to be at the right hand of God. They made many, many mistakes, but they were reliable. Teamwork, the ability to work together even when you disagree. Even when they had explosive disagreements among the 12, they always came back and they worked together as a team. Nobody split off from the group of the 12 and, and started their own, their own rival group of apostles. They worked together as a team. Independence, the ability to work by yourself. And I mentioned they went out by twos, right? They went out two by two into these towns and villages and cities. They worked together in these small little groups without Jesus. They were independent. Leadership, the ability to lead, the ability to make other followers, the ability to grab people and say, hey, can you help us? Communication skills. Now, I want to say this. There's a, there is a very strong caveat to this. I think sometimes we think communication skills, that means an extra, extroverted person who has the gift of gab and can talk to anybody. I don't think that's what Jesus is talking about here. This includes introverts. This includes people who um, might think they don't have com good communication skills, but they do. Um, introverted people, introverts speak with extreme clarity. Their yes is yes, their no is no. How are you doing? Good. That's pretty clear, <laughs> right? An extrovert, how are you doing? Well, let me tell you, my day started, you know, and then we give this whole big long story. Introverts are incredibly precise with their communication. People who have good communication skills make good employees. And then self-awareness. This ability to be aware that, that you make mistakes and you're able to take self-corrective action. Did you ever talk to somebody who has no self-awareness whatsoever? They walk into a room and the room like completely disseminates and they have no clue. Like there are bombs going off and fires being started and, and they look around and they're like, what? Right? Some people don't have self-awareness. But a good employee has self-awareness. They're aware of their mistakes. They're aware of their uh, accomplishments. And they're able to constantly improve. And then finally, integrity. Um, they don't lie, cheat, steal. Um, they have integrity. They are who they are. Uh, I thought this was kind of interesting, too. Um, Three traits that billionaires have in common. There's a guy by the name of Raphael um, Beziag, and he interviewed 21 billionaires, and he found three common traits among all 21 of them. And by the way, there are um, approximately 2,200 billionaires in the world. About 2,200. 67% of those are self-made billionaires, which means they didn't have money. They worked from the ground some of these people had nothing. By nothing, I mean far less than what you and I have. Um, three traits that billionaires have in common. Number one, they succeed no matter what the weather is. It's interesting, isn't it? They don't change, they don't shift with the tides. They don't say, well, 
you don't know how hard it is, you won't hear those words come out of the mouth of a billionaire. As I mentioned, many of these billionaires came out of incredibly difficult situations, incredibly difficult home lives, uh, extreme poverty. It doesn't matter what the weather is. It doesn't matter whether we're having a good economic year or a bad one. It doesn't matter if they're having personal issues in their home or if things are going great. Whatever the weather is, they will continue to grow and succeed. Uh, number two, they don't do it for the money. It's kind of interesting. All of these billionaires said, we don't do it. We don't care about the money. We don't do it for the money. We do it because we had a passion and that passion took hold of us and we wanted to learn and grow and be the best at this, whatever skill it is that, that, that they have. We wanted to be the best at it. We wanted to train other people to follow. They don't do it for the money. They do it to train other people. They do it out of passion. And then finally, they're frugal um, with their time, with their money. They're not out blowing time, you know, blowing their time on social media and spending hours and hours. Uh, and with their money, they're not out blowing their money. But on the other hand, they're, they're incredibly generous. They give a lot of their money away. They give massive portions of their wealth away, but they don't spend it on themselves. They're very frugal. Uh, one of the billionaires um, interviewed had an eight-year-old Toyota Prius. Still drives it. All of his kids drive. Uh, the, the, the newest car that his kids drove was a seven-year-old car. Um, Warren Buffett still lives in the same house that he bought in 1959 or 58. Uh, he bought it for about $35,000. Um, he has not expanded the house. He has not built onto the house. It is the same house that he bought in 1958. He drives an old beat-up car. He spends no more than $3.17 every morning for his breakfast. He, goes, he has the same routine. He goes to McDonald's. He buys pretty much the same meal, but he never spends more than $3.17. They're frugal. So it's interesting, right? Because when we talk about making disciples, when we talk about equipping each other, one of the first things that we tend to do is say, well, we don't have the resources. The problem is that's a myth. It's just not true. What did Jesus tell his disciples when he sent them out? I'm sending you out. Take with you what? Loads of money, right? Take with you loads of money and people and trained, equipped people. No, he said, take nothing. Take no extra money bag. Take no extra food. Take no extra clothes. Go with the clothes on your back and go out and make disciples. I think the message is really simple, and I think we overcomplicate it. And we're looking for all these trained and equipped people. And I want to mention and put a, put a little plug in after this verse um, for what we're doing on Wednesday nights. And um, I think it's bringing a lot of clarity to us for how simple Christianity ought to be. Uh, Matthew chapter 4, 18 through 22. This is when Jesus first called his disciples... Um, this is how it went down. While walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who's called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately, they left their nets and followed him. And going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets, and he called them. Immediately. They left the boat, and their father, dot, 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 and their business, and followed him. I want to back up for a second. You remember this list? Jesus chose these people because he knew that he was going to get qualities of good workers. He knew they were going to be dedicated. He knew they were going to be confident. He knew they'd be reliable. He knew they'd, they'd have teamwork. He knew that they'd be able to be independent. He knew that they'd exhibit leadership skills, communication skills, self-awareness, and integrity. Jesus hand-selected incredibly common people to be his 12 apostles. That's 
absolutely incredi incredible. So I think that we can't have excuses and say, well, we don't have enough resources, we don't have enough knowledge, we don't have enough money in the bank, we don't have, whatever it is, it's just not true. So on Wednesday nights, we're going through this book by um, Tom Rainer and Eric Geiger called Simple Church, Returning to, to God's Process for Making Disciples. And it's absolutely fascinating because he talks about the difference between complicated churches and simple churches. Um, and it's, we're walking through it chapter by chapter. Um, each Wednesday night, we do a different chapter. But the message is astonishingly, astonishingly clear. It's that simple churches, churches that strip away all the complexity of programs and wearing people out and having, you know, having their calendar filled up to the brim, those churches don't succeed, but the simple churches do. The simple churches are the churches that are growing. They're the churches that are discipling people really easily. They're the churches that are reaching into the community. They're the churches that are reaching the unlost. And they're the churches that are passionate and excited, both about Jesus Christ and about his kingdom. And so it's a call to strip away all the complexity and to go back to simplicity and say, look, Jesus did not have a complicated system. Jesus exemplifies simple church. Pick common people who are dedicated, committed, full of integrity. They're hard workers. Tell them, look, we're looking for other workers and send them out. This is kind of an introduction lesson. Um, we're going to delve a little bit um, deeper in the weeks to come. Um, but I wanted you guys to get a snapshot of who the disciples were, who the 12 apostles were. Um, Jesus intentionally selected hard workers. The message is yours. Um, hopefully this entices you a little bit and makes you realize that you guys are all called one and the same. That it doesn't matter your skill level, it doesn't matter your education level. We are all called to be workers for the kingdom. If there's anybody this morning who has any prayer needs or anybody who's not yet taken that step to put Christ on a baptism, we would encourage you to come up or you can go to the back as we all stand and sing together.